Good evening and uh, welcome to our Robertson School Speaker Series event on race, media and the 2020 election. My name is Marcus Messner and I'm the director of the Robertson School of Media and Culture here at VCU. Um, we're excited to present to you what we hope to be will be an interesting and insightful panel discussion about the important social topic of our time. This summer was dominated by the Black Lives Matter movement that has, has put race relations in this country center stage in the presidential race. Tomorrow, we will also witness history when the first female African-American candidate on a presidential ticket of a major party, Kamala Harris, will debate Vice President Mike Pence. Today, we look forward to an enlightening and engaging discussion with our panel and hope that you will also contribute to the discussion. You can post your questions in the Q&A function of this Zoom webinar as a comment on our live stream on our Facebook page or as a tweet on Twitter by using the hashtag VCURobertson. Our moderators this evening are Dr. Alani Hill and Mr. Rob Crocker. Uh, Dr. Hill is an assistant professor in the Robertson School here and teaches in our broadcast journalism program. Previously, she worked at Virginia Union University and at NBC 12. Uh, Mr. Crocker is a doctoral student in our media art and text program and also teaches in our digital journalism program. He previously worked for CBS 6, News 8 here in Richmond, and he also runs his own podcasting show. Uh, before the two of them start us off with an introduction of our panelists, uh, I would like to ask you to mark your calendars for our next speaker series event, uh, which is already next Tuesday at 6 p.m., when we will welcome Washington Post trailblazer Dorothy Butler-Gilliam for a conversation with NBC 12 anchor Diane Walker. You can find more details about that future event on our Robertson School website. And with that, I now turn over the mic to Dr. Alani Hill. Uh, have a great evening with our Robertson School speaker series. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Messner. Uh, let's meet our panel. So we'll start with Mr. Kim Greenwich, Vice President and General Manager of NBC 12. Mr. Greenwich has been Vice President and General Manager at NBC 12 since 2011, but joined the station as an account executive in 1990. In March of 2020, he was inducted into the Virginia Communications Hall of Fame. Uh, next, we have Elliot Robinson, the news editor of Charlottesville Tomorrow. He's a Hampton native, and he began his journalism career in 2006 at the Progress Index in Petersburg, went on to the Hopewell News, the Daily News in Jackson, North Carolina, the Richmond Times Dispatch, and the Daily Progress in Charlottesville. Welcome, Mr. Robinson. Okay. Uh, we also have Donita Roundtree Green, author and CEO of Coming to the Table RBA, a nonprofit committed to racial healing and social equity in Richmond, Virginia. As an author, Donita has toured with LeVar Burton, Ianla Van Zant, Van Zant, and Dr. Bernice King. As a playwright and trauma healing facilitator, she creates workshops addressing various forms of community trauma and race related issues. Next, we have Samantha Willis, an independent journalist and writer for a decade in print, digital, and broadcast media. Her work has appeared in publications including Glamour, Essence, Huffington Post, um, and the Columbia Journalism Review. With a, and within a wide <clears throat> excuse me, range of Virginia-based media, Willis's writing consistently centers on Black history, culture, and perspective. Her work has earned her multiple awards. Welcome, Ms. Willis. Okay, and we also have uh, Mr. Calvin Anthony Duncan, pastor and founder of Faith and Family Church, certified life coach and VCU Hall of Fame basketball player. He was drafted in the 1985 NBA draft in the second round as the 30th pick to the Chicago Bulls. Instead, he opted to play with Athletes in Action, a Christian organization, traveled overseas while playing and coaching in the Continental Basketball Association. So welcome to each of you. We are so happy to have you uh, join us today. Um, we would like to start with you, uh, Mr. Kim Greenwich, we would like to start with you. Uh, you did an interesting NBC 12 viewpoint on George Floyd back on June 5th, 2020, where you mentioned that now people un unapologetically call out racism and protest against it. 
how has media coverage of the Black Lives Matter movement evolved since its inception after the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012? Right, that's, a, that's a very good question, Alani. Um, you know, firsthand, I would say that before the George Floyd murder, you would not hear the subject of racism talked about publicly in media as well as as in offices around the country, at the kitchen table, with different people of different races. That was just something that was pretty much taboo. And if you were in a board meeting and you brought up the word racism, everybody thought the meeting was going to go negative. Um, in my career, and, and I've been in broadcasting since 1979, this is the first time that I've seen people openly in the media embrace. So what are we going to talk about and how are we going to cover race relations, social unrest from all sides and show all of it as it unveils. And one of the things that was most revealing about this one, and I spent a lot of time up late at night looking at Facebook because we were doing Facebook Live long after we you know, would go off the air. Our last, our last news broadcast is at 11.30. And I would be up to two in the morning because now the news was being covered, not only by us, but anyone who had a phone and could go live, uh, they became instant media. So there was no hiding or talking about what was happening as it related to race, and particularly what we saw in terms of some of the unrest, in terms of the relationship between the police um, and people of color uh, in the street. The other thing for us uh, that was interesting, and we may talk about this more later, it was the first time in a while that we were concerned on a nightly basis about not only the safety of everyone who was on the streets in Richmond and across the country, but locally about our journalists who basically had to kind of meld into the crowd, um, not necessarily wear the NBC logo while they were covering the news, and uh, try to cover the story without trying to be part of the story and to stay safe. Uh, it was the first time since I've been here that we hired security initially every single night just to try to keep them safe in the middle of all the chaos. So I would say that I think the media and all of the stations, particularly locally in Richmond, I think we did a very good job basically trying to make decisions on the fly about covering an event that was actually history unfolding. Uh, I wouldn't say we got it exactly right every single time, but I think we did a pretty good job in preparing. And so I think the execution was pretty good. Thank you. Um, this question is for Danita. Danita, how have the protests impacted the 2020 presidential election? public protest is not new to um, America and how we get things done. Um, I was very happy along with a lot of folks in coming to the table to see our youth in particular come out and make their voices heard. And I think the timing is right. People don't realize that we were in the middle of a health pandemic and already in the middle of a race pandemic something that was eating us from the inside out for um, several hundred years. What we, are, we experienced in the protest and what is feeding into our election and our decisions now is the fact that we have so much unfinished business in our country. And so the protest had to happen. And of course, right now, as we enter into this time where people are deciding what our new America is going to look like, it couldn't have happened at a better time. I believe like a circle, we have come full circle to places where we have issues we have not fully addressed and like a protest in the past, race and racism is something our society has not risen to the challenge of truly addressing. Our country is demanding we truly revise this issue and we work towards meaningful change and progress. It's way too long. And I don't believe that we're going to be able to look at either one of these candidates with um, an open mind unless we deal with this particular issue first. Uh, I think that it's important that we realize that this protest started because 
a black man was treated as less than a man. And we know that this is not the first time in our collective history this has happened. It has come to a head. And when I watch the debates, I'm listening for not only all of these storefront issues that we talk about, but I'm listening to how are we moving forward in our humanity? How are we listening to the people in the streets? How are we paying attention to the outcry of those who have been voiceless for so long? So the, the protests are essential to crafting and making a stage for the common voice of the people. And it was necessary for us to have it this time before the election so we could look at these candidates and see where they were standing as part of our humanity. Um, COVID was a devastation to our country, but the race pandemic, as we call it, brought all of these issues of health, schools, um, all of these issues to the forefront. Um, I was happy to see the young people out and the old people out, all the generations out, um, speaking their minds um, in, a, in a way that um, brought this country together in a way that I've never seen in my lifetime. And in fact, um, mirrored what was happening all over the world. I think all of our world leaders are going to look at how um, they move forward in leadership. And they're going to have to be able to pay attention to the outcry of the common man, the every man, the protest man, as we move forward into these elections. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So our next question is for Elliot Robinson. Uh, so you've worked as a journalist in Richmond, Tri-Cities, Virginia, Petersburg, Colonial Heights, Hopewell, um, and also Charlottesville. What are the differences in political attitudes within the Black community? Well, for one thing, uh, there is a lot more Black people who in the grand scheme of things have more political power in the Richmond, Tri-Cities area than in Charlottesville. Um, and that's partially just because it, there's it's more of them here. It's like in Charlottesville itself, before the Civil War, there was more than 50% of the population was Black, and now that's down to 20%. And uh, are, are y'all hearing me okay? I think I'm, I'm hearing some feedback in my speakers. Okay. And then in Charlottesville itself is that you, you don't get that range of voices that you sometimes hear in the, the Richmond area because it is an overwhelmingly democratic city. So we've had just a uh, very few examples of how the black community is not a monolith where we've had our current mayor is an independent candidate and we have so far one other person who's run for city council who was leaning more conservative but he, he wasn't running as a republican but uh i think this uh it's overall it was uh in the in the tri-cities area and in richmond I, I felt there was a, a lot more of a, a political power in that area with the, with the people of color and then compared to, to Charlottesville. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Samantha, um, in Richmond, there are races for the mayor, the city council, and the school board. What are the most important issues for the candidates in such a diverse city? Almost uh, forgot to unmute there. Thank you for the reminder. I, first of all, I'd like to say good evening to everyone again, and thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this uh, conversation uh, with uh, folks that I highly esteem uh, and journalists uh, that I've been following for years. So thank you very much for having me here. I think in terms of, of all the races that we have in Richmond, it's, it's quite a bit to keep up with in addition to our uh, the national elections. But uh, really, I think 
candidates should look to their potential constituents to determine which issues are their priority. So, you know, here in Richmond, certainly our schools um, are, should be a priority for uh, most candidates. And when I say schools, I mean the quality uh, and equity um, and availability of education that we're offering to students in, in Richmond and in the Richmond re uh, region. Um, I think that that's certainly close to the top of the list of what, um, you know, candidates should be uh, paying attention to focusing on. I would also think um, that housing, you know, especially in the past year to two years, we've, uh, Richmond has, has la landed in the national spotlight um, in terms of some of our um, fair housing and, and housing challenges uh, having to do with even the Richmond region, uh, Richmond Housing Authority um, and, and how our residents in some of our most vulnerable um, public housing communities are treated in the, in the city, what impact they have on, uh, you know, legislation, on, uh, you know, the, the thoughts, actions, and practices of our leaders. Um, and there has been, a, you know, R Richmond is half black, a city that's um, fully half black. And that's not always um, what's best for black people and for people of color is certainly not always reflected uh, in our policies and practices here. So, so candidates are gonna be, uh, wanna be um, thinking about housing, especially now um, during the pandemic when we see so many people dealing with um, housing insecurity. Uh, because they are struggling to work and to, to keep up, uh, you know, their rent payment in, in addition to, you know, caring for family members that might be ill or um, just simply caring for their children now. A lot of parents are, were not able to return to the workforce um, uh, in the numbers that they were before because now you're having to, to care for your children. How is that impacting um, the, the citizens here? And, you know, a lot of um, uh, uh, advocacy groups and others have drawn attention to just in the past um, several months that uh, housing insecurity is a real threat here. So certainly candidates want to um, pay attention um, to that. I also think uh, environmental issues and specifically environmental justice issues have become more important to, uh, to, to Richmonders than it was in previous years, maybe because um, there's a greater awareness of, uh, you know, we're paying more attention to the spaces around us. That's the natural, you know, our natural environment and then built spaces and how these, these two can interact with each other. Uh, and certainly, you know, we see candidates like um, Alexis Rogers, who's pledging to improve Richmond's policies and practices concerning or having to do with the environment in a way that, you know, very few candidates have um, before, it's certainly in recent years. So she's come out with these fresh um, ideas on, on how to address um, climate change and environmental issues and environmental justice issues in Richmond. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, something that um, a lot of people are, are focused on. We're in a, a time period right now where we're realizing that um, perhaps the leadership, um, some of our, um, you know, political leaders have not always given top priority to environmental um, issues and sustainability issues. We see, you know, things like uh, the Navy Hill uh, boondoggle. Um, and, and certainly people were, you know, we, what that showed us was that Richmonders want a say in how the spaces that we have are used, are utilized. Uh, and we want those spaces to be for the best benefit of the citizens, not corporations. Um, you know, and certainly we, we see other um, environmental issues around the state. I think that it's something that uh, the current um, mayoral candidates, but also, you know, all the races, they, these are issues that, you know, will it affect, they, they connect to each other and, you know, this kind of web of social um, interaction. So you have to really be mindful of all of these different things. And then certainly, of course, racial and social justice um, certainly in the time since George Floyd um, was killed, that has come to the forefront. But really, there's been an outcry for racial and social justice for, for, for decades. I think it's amplified now because we have cell phones that, uh, um, like Kim was saying a, a little while ago, it's instant media. Anybody who has a cell phone and can capture interactions with, uh, between police and, and members of the public, 
you know, we've seen exactly how uh, inequitable and how unfair and how dangerous and unsafe um, and the disparities with which police interact with uh, people of color and with black people specifically. And, you know, these, 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 this newfound awareness amplified by digital media and social media, I think it, the, these are issues that we can no longer afford to look away from. So a candidate can no longer run a, a campaign without having a significant um, social justice and racial justice um, component to their uh, policy offerings, um, especially here in Richmond, a, a city that is literally built on history and that's struggling to find its evolving uh, identity as we're going through, you know, one of the most serious um, social challenges in the pandemic that we've seen in, in generations. And then also in a time where we, we are able to see the, these instant replays of, of things that are happening um, on our streets every day. Uh, if, if you're not addressing racial um, justice and social justice, I think that you're ill-equipped and, and not prepared to be a candidate um, in any position um, in any of the races in Richmond. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so our next question, we would like to welcome uh, Mr. Calvin Duncan, um, who is the pastor and founder of Faith and Family Church. And also you are a VCU Hall of Fame basketball player. Um, I would like to ask about uh, your church members. Um, in what ways do they feel marginalized and what issues are they talking about most? First of all, I want to say um, welcome to all of my dear colleagues. I'm blessed and fortunate to have this opportunity to be on the same platform with you guys. I was having some technical difficulties, so I do apologize. Um, as far as how we feel, um, do we feel excluded uh, dealing with uh, the fact that maybe the church is not included in certain things? I'll say it like this. Um, there may be a little bit of that um, as far as my church is concerned, and I know every church and um, congregation is different, but my thinking is this. If we are to be the light of the world that we're supposed to be, the salt of the earth that we're supposed to be, and that we make an impact in our community, then therefore, we don't have to worry about being marginalized. We don't have to worry about being feeling socially excluded because we're doing the work of the ministry. Um, unfortunately, um, and I'm just saying, I'm not the traditional pastor, and you know I have a lot of colleagues and pastors who do a great job, but sometimes churches get so focused on their agenda that they forget about the community. And um, our motto at Faith and Family Church is living by faith and building godly families. Our goal is building consummate balanced people doing good works in the community. And I believe that this is really going to put a fire to the churches, I hope, to really focus more on community work. And as far as the second, um, second question, as far as um, our parishioners and what they're talking about, you know, it's really a tender, tough time for us because, you know, you have a group of people, they are, they are, I don't want to say dying to get in, but they are looking forward to getting back in worship. Then you have a group of people that are really cautious. They're really concerned. The CDC is saying one thing, and then you have another report about something else and the droplets and, you know, how far, six feet, 10 feet. And so there's conflicting stories that are causing some of them to, be he to hesitate to go into a place of worship. And then you have, from my perspective, and everybody is different, but I, I, I say it like this. For me and my parishioners at Faith and Family Church, I say it's people over profit, not profit over people. And here's the deal. You know, we all taking a hit. Everybody's suffering in some form or fashion. And so I'd rather take a hit financially as a church, because it's people. Jesus died for the people and rose for the people. I'm for the people over profit. 
I ain't mad at those who are doing it, but I'm just saying that's where we are and that's how we feel. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind our audience that you are able to ask questions in the Zoom QA feature uh, on our Facebook page or on Twitter with the hashtag VCU Robertson. So please send us your questions. We, I, I know that this panel will be more than happy to answer more things than what we've got prepared for them. Uh, I want to shift gears and I want to ask um, Kim, how has the Trump administration's attacks on free press and constant claims of fake news impacted the protocols of journalism? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, and it's a moving ball. Uh, first of all, what we first have to do, and I do this often through emails and returning calls, and I tell all of my people, you get an email or a phone call, you have to return it. And the reason that's important because we have to establish the credibility. So first of all, what is fake news? Um, fake news has been defined by some people the way uh, the president has defined it, and that means mainstream media. And whom he's talking about are the networks, cable media. But when you are talking to anyone who's listening, by affiliation, because we're NBC 12 or we carry uh, the NBC 12 banner, we become fake news. I actually have been in professional meetings when people are so used to speaking to their friends that they forget who's in the room. And they'll say, well, you know how the fake media is. And they'll go, oh, excuse me, Kim, I, I don't mean you guys. Um, we're, we're excusing you. But fake news is news that is not real. It's news that is caused either by Russians doing bots or people making memes and people making up media which is either on TV, on video, wherever. If you're listening to one station or another, whether it's moderate news, liberal news, conservative news, religious news, whatever it is, I always tell people, don't get your source from just one place. Don't get your source of news from just NBC 12. You still can read a newspaper, listen to the radio, listen to podcasts, listen to yourself, uh, use your own common sense and stop turning off your brain and listening to anybody, not just the president, listening to anybody who wants to call something fake because it maybe does not make sense to them or they just choose not to believe the truth. So we have to make sure that we talk to our journalists and part of our protocol is remember that what you're supposed to do is tell the story, not be the story. People get very confused between watching, let's say, NBC Nightly News and Lester Holt is recording the news of the day and then flipping over to MSNBC or Fox News and listening to editorial news when someone is giving their opinion about what they think is happening in the world. You have to be able to turn it off. But unfortunately, people have but so much time in the day. So whether or not you're on the left, the right, the middle, what is happening now is that you have been steered to listen to the things that make you feel comfortable. Uh, on Netflix, there's a really uh, good uh, documentary on that we began to watch the other night, but I will admit I fell asleep because it was too late, called The Social Dilemma. Uh, I read up a little bit more on it so I can prepare to read it. You should definitely watch that. Even social media now is, uh, is steering people with news that basically supports an agenda that we think we believe in. And what it has caused is it's caused people to stop thinking. It's caused people to not say, oh, that's a different point of view, but you know what, let's talk about that. Um, we can still be friends, even though you're a conservative and I'm a moderate or a liberal, we can still be friends and have a discussion as opposed to walking in a room and just assuming, yep, he must have voted for Trump, uh, voted for Hillary, uh, gonna vote for Biden, and then that makes the divide. So I just try to remind people, don't use terms like fake news when you are not defining something that is not true. And also, no matter what authority someone is in, including me, I get emails sometimes and people say, you guys got it wrong. You know what, when we get it wrong, I write them back and I say, yes, sir, you know, we did get it wrong. Yes, ma'am, we did. You have to be willing to do the job, which is to tell the story and not be the story. But uh, it will be something that will be with us for a while, unfortunately, because it's part of our lexicon. But I just ask people all the time to make sure when they hear someone say that's fake news, they ask them, what do you mean by that? And it's startling to get the explanation from people.
Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Samantha, women have become agents of change, Harris being, becoming the first vice presidential candidate of color for a major party, and also faced gender discrimination, uh, the nasty women stereotype, um, and even the, the narrative of Karens um, during this election. How would you compare Sarah Palin's vice presidential run to Kamala Harris's vice pre presidential run? Uh, simply speaking, I wouldn't uh, compare the two because uh, I think they're strikingly different. Um, I, I agree and I see the, you know, the, the, the tenor of the question, the line of questioning is about, you know, both of these women as candidates to a major party, um, to, the, to the vice presidential, um, you know, position. But, you know, here we have Palin who was absolutely in no way qualified for the office that she was seeking, while Harris, you know, whatever we feel about her record, um, she is a seasoned candidate with decades of experience, you know, uh, from her career concerning the law and its application to citizens, which is kind of an important thing to be able to, to have if you're going to be uh, the vice president of this country, uh, having some sense of, of what, what our law means and how it applies to the ev everyday person. And then we, she, obviously she's, uh, you know, spent the majority of her career, you know, in, in uh, criminal justice. And that's a whole different can of worms. Um, so again, no matter how we feel about her record, we can see right away that there's a, a Harris and, and Palin uh, were definitely not um, the, the, the same level of qualifications, yet Palin was taken more seriously, I think, than uh, Harris um, in, in, in some regards. Um, we've seen, um, We've seen that Harris has faced, she's facing an uphill slog. She's faced an uphill slog um, since she, you know, announced um, that she was going to uh, take on this um, campaign. I, I, I think that she will continue to be challenged. And I think it's important to note that that's not surprising because as a woman of color, you know, Harris is, is following in the footsteps of other uh, women of color and black women in politics. You know, we can look at historic examples and we can also look at uh, contemporary examples. You know, uh, black women candidates, uh, women certainly more broadly, but specifically women of color like Harris have faced uh, extreme scrutiny um, of their policies, um, of their views, even their appearance and their personal life. You know, we've, we've, seen, um, we've seen them face these, you know, questions on a grander scale than uh, uh, some other candidates would have, certainly than men and, and some, to some extent other uh, female candidates. Um, you know, we, we just saw Stacey Abrams, you know, the first black woman um, major party gubernatorial nominee um, in America and, and arguably she was one, she remains one of the most capable and talented and prepared candidates for any office, but certainly for you know office there in the history of Georgia's gubernatorial race. Um, but she faced an incredible amount of scrutiny over things like you know her personal finances and why did she have so much student loan debt without taking into account the life experiences of Black people and the disparities um, that 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 they face and how that affects you know the the building of wealth and how that affects. Um, home ownership and all these different um, facets of life um, that there are disparities between um, uh, uh, black people and people of color and other people. Um, so we, we see even, you know, Abrams faced th this extreme scrutiny in her run, ultimately lost um, the, the election there, aided greatly by voter suppression tactics. You know, the same playbook that we, we've seen in the 1960s <laughs> on through pre, you know present times, um, there are uh, several voter suppression tactics used. We're seeing some of those same things coming back um, now. You know, closing polling locations, um, the the interference with the postal service. You know, uh, in regards to how we are able to to do mail in ballots. Um, you know, we we see that in a, in a contempor another black woman's political journey. We see Shirley Chisholm. You know, she was. Um, the first black woman elected to serve in Congress 
and then the first uh, black woman candidate for a major party's nomination in the 72 presidential presidential election she said you know before her death that she faced much more discrimination because she was a woman than because she was black she felt that you know at every turn in her career the, the obstacles she was running into were because of her sex because of her gender um and not you know right her race she felt her race came second but there were two challenges here so i think we see all of that reflected in harris's uh, uh journey you know in, in her campaign at this time uh and i think it's all of these things we need to be aware of um and apply that context to when we're thinking about um Harris as a potential VP, and when we, you know, tune in to watch her debate uh, our current VP Pence um, tomorrow. Okay, thank you. So the next question, I'm going to open it up to anyone on the panel who would like to answer. Uh, what are your assessments of the first presidential debate between President Trump and Vice President Biden? I'll, I'll go. Good. All right. I'll give a voice to that. I, before it came on, I had such anticipation that it was going to be something that would be like just okay. I can get a chance to see what Biden is talking about and see if President Trump has have any type of change of heart. The bottom line, I'm not a president basher. He was very rude. He constantly interrupted. Um, by them over and over again to have gotten to a back and forth, back and forth. And you and I, we all know, and I mean, Kim, you know, over there at NBC and you guys, uh, communication co, C-O, is about two people have an opportunity to listen. That's why God gave us two ears and one mouth <laughs> so we can listen and then be able to talk. And I want to say that to me, it is symbolic. What happened is symbolic to how America is not hearing the African American people. I believe it's symbolic. It's the same thing. The time, bear with me for a moment, but the time we say Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. All, you know, we, we're not, no, give us an opportunity to share why we're saying it. Now, I'm not saying I echo the sentiments of Black Lives Matter. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about the organization, but it's a reason, America, we are saying Black Lives Matter because in over history, it seems like we don't matter. Therefore, we must have a clear clarion call to say Black Lives Matter. Therefore, I close with this, I believe that we got to learn how to listen to each other, how to be more be able to tolerate others, different thoughts, beliefs, so that way we can work together. And like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was saying that, you know, if we don't listen to each other, we're going to perish like fools. We have to listen to each other and try to meet and come to common ground. Thank you, Calvin. I, I want to stick with uh, something that came up in the debate. Uh, Danita, I want to direct this to you. Um, if we're asking the president to condemn white supremacists, should both candidates condemn Antifa? Well, first, I'm going to say that um, I believe that we are truly in um, adversarial mode. Um, we are, um, I won't say nitpicking, but we are um, drawing our lines in the sand and we're looking to see who's on each side and not really paying attention to what any of the real issues are, um, i.e. the debate that we witnessed um, last week. Um, when it comes to an, uh, even the term Antifa and what Antifa is, I believe that in this context, we use that word as a scapegoat to um, not look at a lot of the real issues. Um, and, even, and I'll even go further than that. The term white supremacy is also a word that we use to, um, for a, a, really a, a small marginalized group of people. When we think of white supremacists, we think of people in Klan robes and, and, and um, burning crosses. And, and believe me, that, that spirit, that energy does exist. But those, um, those are the, the, 
the two far ends of the conversation. I believe that sets up a detracting and false a false narrative. And I know in coming to the table, one thing that we stress in our conversations, we have facilitated conversations, is that people need to speak from their own personal experience, not from a group of, about a group of black people or a group of white people, but we talk about ourselves and how we feel. So when you, when you have terms that are already put in place like that, that define us, it, it puts us in very narrow boxes. Um, so I would throw both of those words out of the conversation. Um, white supremacy is a concept and an institution we have been battling since the inception of the United States. And now we have Antifa. It has been defined and redefined through the uh, institution of slavery and Jim Crow and mass incarceration. And I like the, the circle because we do tend to go around in circles in these conversations. We come upon the issue over and over again um, white supremacy is our past, it's still part of our present, um, and we will, be, it will probably be something that we're taking into the, the future, even though we're trying our best at coming to the table not to do that. We have to tackle it now so we don't have to draw that line in the sand anymore. Um, I, I don't like either one of those terms, Antifa or white supremacists. Um, it forces people to choose a side, and um, that's not what we should be asking people to do. We should, the only side that we need to have in this conversation is the betterment of the United States of America, which is, I believe, in the past um, at least 10 years particularly, we have truly gotten away from that concept in a huge way. What does it mean to be an American? Um, particularly in this administration, where right out the gate, right out of, out, out of the gate, we were charged to look at our immigrants, Americans, or even black people, or, uh, Americans, or even if women, the misogynistic um, attitudes that came with this administration, are women even really invested in Americans either? Um, too many lines here. There, there are really too many lines. So we need to go back to, again, and I know it may sound mamsy pamsy, but we really need to look at our humanity. Can we possibly get back to a place where we think about um, us as all being human beings? I, I say get back to that, but we've never really been there um, in the United States anyway. Uh, but can we concile long enough to say, all right, we're in the same boat here. Even if we like black people or we don't like black people, if we hate white people or we don't. These are the things that we need. We need good health care. We need great schools. We need places that people can live in safety. And we need to stop creating new boundaries because God knows we had enough to begin with. So um, I really don't even think that either one of our, um, our presidential candidates right now are even mature enough to handle a conversation with that many borders. We need the kind of support from our candidates that see everybody, regardless of where you are on that spectrum, everybody to see all of us as Americans and as human beings first. Throw out all of these um, um, contagions that separate us in these ways. Antifa, yes, that's a, that's a percentage of the society. White supremacists, that's another one. But what about all the rest of us here who need the same things all the time? That's what our candidates need to be looking at. And they don't need to be condemning anything. They need to, about, need to be about saving the American people from this, um, this system of total horrid adversity that our leadership in a lot of ways has brought us to. Uh, in addition to what Danita said, um, I would say that I think it is perfectly acceptable for us to ask our candidates to denounce any kind of violence and supremacy yes. against any people. Yes. If you, if you cannot do that, I don't think that you're qualified to lead the people of the United States of America, the state of Virginia, or the city of Richmond. Right. You, you have to be able to say that because 
the safe haven has to be for the people who do want to have a meaningful conversation. Those people that believe in hate on either side of the aisle need to know that there is not room for them at the table until they change their behavior. If you refuse to say it or you use cold words, you're signaling to them that their way of life is still okay as long as you vote for me. And that's what I felt was happening at that debate. It was very easy. If someone asked me right now, do you denounce violence that is not self-defense from any race of people, I will say right now to, to, the, to the, all of the audience that is here, I denounce it. I don't need to use cold words. I don't need to hide behind anything. And you can meet me at the front door and I'll say the same thing to you. If you are a decent person, it is the easiest thing to say. So what I question is, and I believe that when the question was asked of, of Biden, did he denounce Antifa? I think he should have discussed that if there are violent people in Antifa who are not defending themselves, he should have said, yes, I denounce them. I think when you have that fear of, of worrying about who you're not appeasing, then you are not really ready to truly be a leader. That, that is just my opinion. I'm just looking for someone to be honest, not perfect. I'm looking for you to be honest and defend your position. And uh, I thought that when, when that question came up, oh, yeah, it was just, uh, I mean, the, the entire American people were just uncomfortable <laughs> that, that yeah. I couldn't say, yes, I denounce white supremacy and not have to name a group that you need to let me know if I need to denounce them. And then, unfortunately, to say a couple of days later that I've never heard of the Proud Boys. Well, that's kind of hard if you're reading any updates that you get and briefs that you get. If you didn't hear, if you didn't know anything about the Proud Boys, then your administration is not doing their job every day. So that, again, is an insult to our intelligence. And I think that's a problem. I agree. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, so switching gears, my, my next question is for Elliot. Um, we're actually going to stick with the thought of saving America. Um, what did the Trump administration get right? In what ways have they helped the economy and made America great again? If, uh, if looking at this, like since 2016, the, the pandemic has completely skewed any answer that I could give at this point. Since the beginning of the year, when we were learning about COVID, there were so many things that were both in the administration's control and out of its control that has overshadowed everything else. I, I, don't, I don't think that there's a, a way to really assess the presidency anymore because of that hard line of pre-COVID and post-COVID. It's gonna take until after the pandemic is over to look back and, and assess what has, what has happened. I mean, we've had economic gains that have been wiped away, jobs that have been lost. There's like 200,000 people have died. It's just in the, just so much has happened in 2020 that you can't really like look at, well, the past three years were great. And this was one bad spot is that you have to look at the whole, the total of all of it. So I, yeah, so again, it's like, I, I don't think we can, we can assess it at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Calvin, I'd like to ask you a quick question. Uh, it's a two-parter. Um, what are your thoughts on sports leagues and many athletes growing support for Black Lives Matter movement, protests kneeling during national anthem? Uh, what has fueled its evolution since Colin Kaepernick first began kneeling in 2006? And I would add that uh, recently, recently the VCU men's basketball team uh, took a photo at the Robert E. Lee statue, which is now known as the Marcus Peter Circle. Um, what are your thoughts on student athletes using their voices in social issues. So not just professional athletes, but student, a student athletes using their voices. All right, first I wanna to go to the professional athletes that are demonstrating and protesting by way of kneeling. Um, I wanna be very sensitive here because number one, I understand that their actions in their body language or kneeling down could cause some people to think 
that they are disrespecting the flag. For those who honor the flag, those who fought all of um, our armed forces in every branch, male, female. Um, however, the kneeling was never protesting the flag. The kneeling was never saying, I don't love my country. It wasn't we, um, about that. The kneeling was simply this. You are not hearing, once again, like the debate, you're not hearing our voices. We are seeing too many of our young black men and women being murdered. And we need to share and say something. We need to do something. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that rioting is the voice of the unheard. Well, I wanna say that when they kneel, the athlete kneels, that's a very nonviolent action to say this needs to be tended to. I am not about rioting, but I am about protesting and there is a difference so the athlete was saying bring attention to this and then you have these individuals who they say well you know you know i've had conversations with people because i was a former athlete as well well you know calvin i i i just want to watch sports you know i i, I don't want to got enough politics i get it However, if we're treated right, you can just watch sports. But what I want you to understand is that those athletes, and I've been there before, in their neighborhoods, they go back to the neighborhood that other people don't know about. And so they are a representation of those who may have a voice, but nobody's listening. But, oh, you'll listen to LeBron James. You'll listen to somebody that you admire athletically. So that's, um, you know, that's one thing. So once again, I reiterate, it's not disrespect that that wasn't their aim. But when President Trump said to about the football players and said that these um, son of a bees, these bastards, um, you know, need to stand up. You know, you know, majority of the NFL is black. Unfortunately, like myself, I'm 59 years old. I don't know. I don't have a clue who my dad is. It's not good. So who are you really talking to? And I think there was a better way of handling it if we learn how to come to the table and respect what we're saying. So to those that are in the military, uh, we honor you. And I want to say this, because I know one time somebody was saying, um, you know, this white gentleman who said, well, you know, my mother and father, they, no, my, my grandfather fought in World War II and, and so forth and so on. Well, guess what? Black people did too. And then after they fought, came back over here to the country they was dying for, and then had to get in the back, go to the back of the bus. Couldn't eat at the same table. Was treated like trash. So before you start telling me how patriotic your family is, let me tell you this right now, ladies and gentlemen, Black America has been one of the most faithful group of people in this United States of America. We've been spit upon and we wasn't fooled. We didn't think it was rain. We know it was spit, but we kept moving because we understood the mission. So I am very proud of those individuals. I trust that action could be done. And then I want to say to the lady who's told LeBron James, shut up and dribble. I want to say we're not going to shut up and dribble because here's what you want. 
You want our entertainment. You want us to ooh you and out and woe you with our abilities, but you don't want to hear our mind. You don't want to hear our thoughts. You got to understand we recognize that we are more than just an athlete. And it's very important for people to recognize that. And we need to also teach, and I do it too. I have some mentees, I have a mentee in the NBA and things to teach them that they have a platform that they only have for a short period of time. And besides buying all the cars and the bling, 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 they need to make an impact. So I am very proud of them. I think uh, what they have done is very admirable. And here's what I love. It ain't just black people kneeling. I love to see how they have all come together. We're talking about not only in basketball, but in football, in baseball, you know, predominantly white sport. Because why? At the end of the day, just like the every, wherever, whatever country you go to, if you smile and don't know the language, they know that you're smiling because you're happy. They know it that you're smiling because you're saying welcome. I wanna say that deep down on the inside of the human heart, we know what's right from wrong. And the only thing we're saying is we wanna treat, treat others as you wanna be treated. And I'll go to the um, VCU situation because I, I know our panelists, I want everybody to have a chance to share um, taking a picture in front of the area where the, the Robert Lee statue was. I'm just saying, I'm from New Jersey. I never figured out why you have a monument of soldiers who lost the war. You lost. You lost. <laughs> Admit it. What, what is that word? Concede. You know, <laughs> you know, you lost. I don't, I don't, you know, I didn't, I don't get trophies for, I mean, you know, uh, you know, win a championship, it's only one champion. And so that's the mindset, unfortunately, of the South, that we're going to honor people who lost. And then when we talk about it, you have a group of people who say, well, this is our heritage. Well, I ask this question, are you proud of your heritage? What does your heritage stand for? Oh, you're proud that your forefathers enslaved human beings? You're proud of that? You're proud that they just raped our women and dehumanized our men? You're proud about, that's your heritage? Wow. That's amazing. So I just want to say, um, for those athletes who took the picture, you know, we're not trying to antagonize anyone. I don't know what it was all about. You know, so I don't have much comments about that, but the only thing I'm saying is this, and please don't get me wrong. For me, taking the statues down, all right, that's cool. But it don't mean nothing if policies are not changed. It doesn't mean nothing if the mindset is not changed. It's just a, a visual to say something happened. But something needs to happen more so on the inside of the human heart than the statues. So anyway, that's what I got to say about it. And I want to be brief. I want to add to that. So thank you for everything that you said, um, awesome. Pastor Duncan. That, that was awesome. I just wanted to add, um, I'm a mother of three sons and two stepsons. You know, they have a husband and a father that fought in the war and came home and did not get the GI Bill. Hello, as a lot of black men did not. Um, but and I just wanted to preface all that because um, I don't know if Samantha remembers, but right after the Colin Kaepernick um, uh, move there, coming to the table had a big event um, through Parks and Rec. And, uh, and it was about that. It was about Kaepernick and his, um, his, his decision to kneel and what it meant to people. And how it was, it seemed so divisive at the time. But so we were very intentionally invited community. We had a, an overwhelming amount of, of men come, which was awesome. We had police officers come. We had um, Marines, um, uh, other um, 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 soldiers, um, sailors. Every everyone came. 
Um, and we had athletes that came. I mean, I, we were amazed that so many folks came out for this conversation. Um, and overwhelmingly, they applauded Kaepernick's decision. Because if you stand up at all and you fight for this country in any way, I don't care if you do it overseas, if you do it from an army base, or if you do it in a blue uniform out here on our streets in Richmond as a police officer, you want people to be able to um, recognize and stand up in this country and be heard. That, that's what all of those civil liberties are all about. That, that's what it's for. So um, when we hear the opposite of that, like, oh, this is a flag, and if you, if you disrespect that, you're un-American, that's bunk. That's garbage. We protest, just like those people who threw the tea off of that boat. <laughs> right. We protest because we love America, because we can see it being something else. And that's why we show up. And that is how you bring love to the fight. You show up, you protest, you have your, 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 um, your voice heard, and you be a part of the conversation. And, and, and thank you so much. And Rob, I just want to get in. I see some, some math got a hand up, and I know you're ready to roll. But I want to make this clear in what I said. Um, I don't believe that we needed to fund the police and all that stuff. I don't believe that the police officers, all police officers are bad because the majority of them are good. I have many of them that I know. I have many of them that go to my church. I have actually grown up in New Jersey. The first, the way I got out of, stayed out of trouble, I was in a police athletic league, the PAL in Linden, New Jersey, okay? And um, right now, I'm, I just got on the board with, um, with Chesterfield Police Athletic League and the City of Richmond Police Athletic League. I'm in both of them. Listen, so I'm not about that foolishness, okay? I'm not about that foolishness. I believe that we just need to visit some things and see how we're doing some things. But I believe in our wonderful police officer, our men and women. And then I do want to say this in closing, that the most underrated and abused people, I believe, on this planet is the African-American woman. And, um, you know, as men, of all races, we got to look out for them. You know, we really do because they are brilliant. They're awesome. You know, I'm my aunt, you know, my mother died when I was five days old, never knew my dad. My aunt at 42 years old decided to adopt me and raise me. Um, she died when I was going to my senior year in high school. But the bottom line is that woman and the woman who birthed me, I wouldn't be the person I am. You know, and so the, the, the woman, the African-American woman, they are great. And I honor them. I respect you guys. And um, y'all just know that y'all are queens to me. And I just wanted, I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to jump in really quick. Um, Danita and um, Reverend Duncan had made points about the monuments. Um, to bring the discussion back to media, I think it's really important to highlight it's, to, it's the responsibility of the media to not just report when we see these protests, racial clashes, you know, that uh, that's a term that's been floating around uh, to, 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 to remember that the story is not only that people are protesting against monuments. The story is how what those monuments represent is still causing systemic, systematic racism that impacts people of color to this day. And I want to highlight the fact that we've had some excellent reporting um, out of the, the Times Dispatch, I saw a, a really in-depth report. I believe VPM reported on this, uh, how lost cause mythology was uh, being filtered into Virginia textbooks for generations and how those, um, that mythology, um, that Confederate veneration, um, you know, someone said a few minutes ago, you've never understood why people would, um, you know, build statues to folks who lost. Well, it's because we had generations of students here in Virginia, and I'm sure elsewhere across the country, that were being taught um, this lost cause flavored <laughs> um, education um, when it comes, came to our history. So, you know, we've made gains in the state. Uh, some of our uh, leaders have made gains in the state in terms of trying to address that. That's the root issue. I think that sometimes we can get distracted by, uh, you know, reporting on 
people pulling down parts of, of the monument, people, you know, crowd control and protesters clashing with police. And all of those things are important, but it's also important for media to contextualize why the monuments matter to so many people, that it's not just about these giant hunks of metal and stone, it's the ideology that they represent um, and that, um, that, that viewpoint that is still, you know, is insidious, it's hidden, but it's still affecting housing policy, it's still affecting education, it's still affecting uh, criminal justice, it's still affecting so many different factors and sectors of our society. So it's the job of um, journalists and, and writers to, to find the deeper story and not just report on, on the surface level. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. This was an awesome discussion and I wish we had more time, but we have to take a few questions from the audience. So uh, Dr. Messner, we would like to welcome him back. Great. Thank you, Alani. And thanks everybody for the very engaging uh, discussion. We have questions flowing in um, from our audience um, and these are kind of free for all. So feel free to jump in to, uh, to answer them. The, the first one is from uh, Sierra Parks. Um, there were protests for Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and Trayvon Martin, but those protests quickly died down and the media cover coverage was nowhere near what we have seen for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, why are there more protests now in America and across the world? What is the difference now compared to back then? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that one because um, I don't think anyone saw it coming. But I think that one of the blessings of COVID was that everyone was tuned to their TV set and they saw for nine minutes what pain looked like. They were able to see for nine minutes when someone says, I can't breathe, what that looked like. They were able to see all of the things that had happened since the civil rights movement where they might not have understood. Sometimes you're listening, but not understanding. And when you're at home and you're seeing it on all media in living color, you're seeing that story. That's why you saw the protests on the street had black and white people. You saw it go internationally around the country because it was pure inhumanity to man, but it wasn't the first time. And you never know when the straw is going to break the camel's back. And that was the moment. And it wasn't because of media that it happened. It was because of young people. This is when, when, when people talk about the BLM movement, this is the new civil rights movement that has been reprised. This is the civil rights movement where people are seeing inhumanity to people they're understanding what a basketball player, a football player rather, who just wanted to take a knee to say, as, as Reverend Duncan said, Pastor Duncan said, listen to what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying, pay attention to your society. We talk about history and, and how the history books are written and how we talk about the monuments. If we simply would just tell the full history of how it occurred, Young people from the time that they are one years old will understand it, accept it, and say, what can we do to be a better society? But when we try to change history, and the difference now is that media, not just organized media, but people on the streets with a phone can say, see for yourself what is happening. We have to ask ourselves, what would have happened if there was no video of what was happening to George Floyd? Just that small, little thing of people being able to judge for themselves. For the first time in my career, I had, and, and, and this is what I'm, I'm gonna say about all people have to be involved in this and not just black people. The civil rights movement didn't just benefit people of color, it benefited women, Jewish people, Italians, anyone who was marginalized was able to get a source of freedom from what happened in the civil rights movement. The same thing has to happen right now. Good, righteous people need to say, I don't want to listen to that noise anymore about the negative images that you want to portray. 
So what has happened now is that everyone has to participate in being their own personal journalist. And when you see a truth, you need to go ahead and put it on social media if that's what works for you. But you need to distinguish between people who are just trying to push an agenda and those that are really trying to tell the current story in history. And if we would just tell history the way it unfolds and tell the truth about it, it would be different. We will never go back to where we were before. And I thank COVID for that. And everything happens for a reason. I just want to add, it's like, it, it's like the original civil rights movement. It's just unfortunate that once again, it took having that raw image of just the brutality that happens to people for to get that critical mass of people who are waking up to this, like something has to be done. This isn't right. And I, it's unfortunate that it had to happen that way. But now that we have people out there processing that they want change again, I mean, we are moving forward. And the thing that we have to separate uh, to go back to what we were previously talking about is that people need to understand that just because somebody is protesting, it doesn't mean that they are anti-America. It's that they care about this country. They live in this country and they want it to do better. And that's what, that's what people want. They're not saying that I don't like America anymore. This is terrible. We should throw everyone out. It's that we want it to do better. I came from a long line of people in the military. As a kid, I was marching around, waving the flag around. But it comes to this point where those patriotic songs you're singing, the pledges that you're, you're saying, you realize, well, it's not applying to people of color. And I need to draw attention to that because I was, I was brought up to love this country. And the only way that I can love this country is if it continues to better itself. Okay, thank you. Here's, a, here's another question from Yvonne. Uh, how can journalism contribute towards having an open conversation and educating about social justice versus creating further divisions between different viewpoints? I can, I can take a first stab at that. Sure. Um, I, I would say, uh, I think that it's important, um, again, like I said a few moments ago, for uh, journalists and for media organizations to dig deeper than the surface issues and just, you know, certainly we have to report the facts, but I think there's a, a, a level of context that should be added, especially when we're um, talking about issues like racial and social justice, that if you, if you introduce it as, you know, there's this, um, there's a, a kind of a difficult, it, it becomes difficult to be, to be, uh, you know, to not take sides, uh, especially if you're a journalist of color or a writer of color, um, because like Elliot said a minute ago, you, you could have been raised to love this country, but you can see the disparities. You can see that it's not liberty and justice for all. So I think it's, it, especially, it shouldn't only be the job of journalists of color um, and black and, and um, media organizations who serve um, um, readers and viewers of color. It should be up to the entire media establishment to really provide context um, and opportunity to educate the viewers, listeners, readers. Um, a few years ago, and Danita knows this, um, and some others might know this too, uh, I was editor full-time at Richmond Magazine uh, when we had an incident in Richmond where someone wore blackface in public and it was a big, huge um, controversy with some people saying, you know, what's the big deal? It's just a Halloween costume. And then other people saying, wow, this makes a mockery of black people. This is a tra tradition that goes back to, you know, the antebellum South. Um, and it's, it's solely to make fun of slaves. Why, do we still, why are we still seeing this in 2016? Uh, so to, to kind of, um, you know, good media and good um, journalism is going to be responsive to the, the issues of the day and to what their audience is um, thinking about and what's impacting them. Um, so really, I worked with Richmond Magazine to hold um, this forum called The Unmasking. Um, and it was about a conversation, a frank conversation about how race, the history of race and racism in, in the city of Richmond and how it continues to impact every uh, sector, every um, facet of, of uh, life in Richmond. Uh, it was an opportunity to not just hear, you know, from experts on, on panels or from, from professionals um, and historians, et cetera, et cetera, but it was also an opportunity for the, for the public 
to ask questions, to get involved, and for Richmond Magazine as a media organization to be able to see how they could further serve their audience um, through innovative programming uh, uh, like the unmasking. And since then, I've gone on to, to do other unmaskings in Charlottesville. Um, the most recent one was in Hampton Roads. We'll probably be returning to the Hampton region um, in the spring of 2021 for the next unmasking. But it's an example of how media organizations can really uh, provide a forum for people to, to discuss these ideas and to, to learn more uh, about these ideas. Another example is uh, RTD's Public Square. Um, uh, their, their speaker series they've had for a long time. There's, there's many media organizations that host these type of speaker series. And I think it's important to continue um, those types of efforts, but it's also important that media organizations use those opportunities as an example to better learn their audience, their readers, viewers, or listeners, and how they can better serve them. Thank you. Here's a, here's a question from another attendee. It seems Donald Trump has a love-hate relationship with the media. I think you can say that. Um, in your opinion, has his vocalization of his viewpoint of the media helped or hindered the advancement of his campaign? That, that's been a debate in my household. Uh, <laughs> From the, uh, the beginning of the campaign, my wife said, not you, Kim, because I know you just happened to work there, uh, but if the media would stop showing uh, Donald Trump and, and discussing everything he says, maybe people would not be following everything that he does. But let's really examine that. It is our responsibility to report what is happening. If you say who you are, uh, we're going to let people hear who you are. It's for the audience to make that decision. The problem with media was that look at how long it took. Because in the protocol of our business, I would never say, Marcus, you're a liar when you said something on this panel that was not true. Even if you said it 10 times, it took months before reporters actually realized that now they had to actually say, I remember I was watching the Today Show and they finally said, here are the things, and this just happens to be Donald Trump. He's not the only politician or anyone who's run for office that is told they lie. But he probably has the record and I think most people will agree with that. But finally you had journalists had to now change the protocol in the industry to do fact checking live all the time. That has not happened in our lifetime. That every time something comes out, there's someone's job to say to the, the producer and then to the journalist, okay, here is the truth about what was just said. But unfortunately, when someone in power and influence says something, even when it's an untruth, people who believe in that person, that now becomes the truth and everything else that someone says is us beating up on that individual. And that's where we have found ourselves. I honestly have people who I've, I, I can call them colleagues and, and some of them friends who I've heard say, I think you guys are so unfair to Donald Trump. And I go, what do you mean? And when they begin to talk, they're usually talking about um, uh, discussion shows at editorials or they're talking about things that we report that actually came out of his mouth. And I will, they will repeat them. And I will say, well, you know, that's not true. And then we Google fast time, because that's what I believe in. You could Google it yourself, and then you can show the truth to people. And the unfortunate thing is now is that even some people, when you show them the truth, because when a lie gets repeated so much, if the person saying it believes the lie, but unfortunately, the listener who wants to support that person believes the lie. And I will tell you, this is firsthand, and all of you on this panel have seen it, but I've seen it from people who I never thought that I would hear believe a lie and endorse it. That's a dangerous place uh, for us to be. But we have to tell that story. And then Americans have to decide who they want to vote for, and that's regardless of, um, of what side of the aisle you're on. But I will, I will say, if you're American, you can't be a large percentage of the people who are 
registered to vote and don't even bother to go to the polls. Um, I, I don't really have a lot of conversation for you, especially at this time, you don't vote for whomever you believe in. And I mean that, but you need to exercise that vote more than ever before. Thank you, Kim. And we're getting several questions that, that uh, look ahead past the election. Uh, we have one that asks, what should the black community do if uh, President Trump wins a second term to keep the momentum going? Um, how, uh, how do we get more citizens involved to create change from within or outside the system? And then uh, another question um, from uh, a professor here at the Robertson School, Vivian Medina, uh, what can Latino Latinx people do in their daily lives that can support the black lives Afro-Latinos within our communities in Virginia? Well, I'll step out first on this one. Um, coming to the table is a racially blended organization. We have, um, in fact, we're mostly white European, but um, we have a lot of African Americans who come for what we call the courageous yet clumsy and un uh, often uncomfortable conversation on race. And we have already had this conversation as a family. What is going to happen after the election? Because um, as a nonprofit, you know, we don't um, we don't endorse candidates or, or that sort sort of thing. But as Kim said, so so wonderfully, we do pressure everyone to go out and have their voice heard um, and to be recognized in the system because this is it. Um, as a grassroots organization, we also realize that change, just like the protests that we were talking about earlier, comes from the people. We do this. We decide who our leadership is going to be. We vote for those people, we put them in office, and we still have a civic responsibility to do the work. So um, first on our agenda is racial healing. And, that, and even though that may sound small, that is huge. Because in order to get to that, let's be clear, it's going to take reparative action and it's going to take reparational action, which is two different things. Reparations is HR 40 and what is owed to black people. Reparative action is what we do as citizens to work in systems and with our communities to improve our schools to make sure people don't get evicted because they're $5 or five days late on their rent, to make sure that we have good health care, to make sure no one goes hungry in this country, and especially somebody who lives a few doors down from me. These are the actions that we all as citizens need to be a part of right now today. You need to find a church, you need to find an organization, you need to uh, form a buddy system to go out here and start being part of the change that you wanna see. And the day that we recognize this reparational change, the day that we recognize reparative change, not only is it going to help African-Americans and people in, of color, it is going to reflect across this nation Anytime you help people that have been as marginalized and, and unheard as forgotten as black people in this, in this city and in this country, anytime you, you shore up that foundation, it's going to do a lot for everybody else on that same, on that same scale. So we need to put the healing part first, the restorative actions part first. The healing conversation needs to come first. Our numbers, and I'll just have to say this, when we started coming to the table six years ago, there were about 10 of us meeting together. And now we have over 1,500 members right here in the, the former capital of the Confederacy. And Donald Trump actually has made it possible for me to have a full-time job because now people are realizing that we need to come to the table to talk about these things that we have been avoiding forever. Avoiding forever. I know I'm on a soapbox here. But the gist of it is, when we stop seeing ourselves as several different communities, and we see ourselves as one Richmond, regardless of what your race is, when we see your problems, um, Mr. Mesner, as my problems too, and my problems as yours, that is when we can come together and have true, sustainable, restorative, healing change. 
Thank you. Thank you, Danita. Mm -hmm. um, we, have a, we have a question um, from, um, oh, no, it just uh, scrolled away on my screen, from Shaden uh, Tesfaldet, um, who is asking a question about the local election that you also uh, just referred to. And many people, particularly in the younger voter demographic, show little interest in local elections compared to national ones. With the Richmond mayoral election coming up, are there any ways to mobilize young Richmond voters to be more interested and invested in local elections? By the way, a little pitch. Um, after our panel today, um, our friends from NBC 12 and uh, VPM are broadcasting a, a mayoral um, debate at uh, 7 o'clock. So that's something uh, to tune in as well. But uh, how, do, how do get younger voters um, get more involved in, in local elections where they can actually have an impact? I think it's a, I think, I'm sorry, was someone going to say? No, go ahead. I, I think it's a very good question. And I think the answer really probably is not with us, but probably, and I'm not saying that everybody here is not young, uh, but is probably really going to the younger voters and, and, and asking the questions of why are you not interested in local politics? And, and I think part of the reason is, is that we focus so much on adults that we don't focus on young people's issues. Uh, so if the candidates don't spend a lot of time going to college campuses, going to high schools, because those are the people who are going to be ready to vote pretty soon and speak to their issues, I, I believe that they will feel detached because they feel that all of the issues are issues that they need to worry about later on. But uh, honestly, they're issues that are affecting their very way of life. So uh, one of the things that Samantha talked about in terms of responsibility of media, and I'll be brief on this, one of the things that we decided to do very differently when I talked to my news director, Frank Jones, we held a series of specials this year, probably more than we ever have before, to use single topic issues to speak for an hour, uh, to invite the public in to speak for an hour. We, we do that often uh, at four to five, and then we repeat them, and we're gonna continue to do them because we find that uh, more people now want to know more uh, about what's going on locally, because really your local politics are just as important and in many cases more important than what's happening nationally. And I think that we have to focus on young people and just ask them, what would you like to see and how would you like to be more involved? And I think that's where the answers lie. Thank you. Anybody else have a, have a take on that? I thought that was well said. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you everyone uh, and to our audience uh, for tuning in uh, with us this evening. As we said, um, we have a, a mayoral debate uh, tonight at seven o'clock, uh, live on NBC 12 and on VPM. And uh, here at the Robertson School, uh, we would like to welcome you back uh, next Tuesday for our next speaker series event um, with uh, Washington Post trailblazer uh, Dorothy uh, Butler Gilliam, who will be in a conversation with uh, um, Diane Walker, anchor at uh, NBC 12. And uh, we will also uh, welcome you back uh, after the election on November 5th, where we will have a, a discussion about, uh, with the simple title, what happened. Um, there will be lots, uh, lots to talk about um, uh, after the election. Um, whatever you do, vote, um, whoever you um, vote for, as uh, Kim Greenwich said tonight, you know, if you don't make your voice heard, then you have uh, nothing to complain about. Um, so make sure that, uh, that you uh, cast your vote um, in, uh, in this presidential election. I'd like to uh, thank our uh, panelists, Samantha Willis, uh, Kim Greenwich, uh, Danita Roundtree Green, um, Elliot Robinson, and uh, Kevin Duncan, and also our two moderators who did an excellent job, uh, Dr. Alani Hill. And, uh, and Rob Crocker. Um, uh, Rob and Elani had the idea uh, for this panel, so it was great um, to see this uh, uh, finally happen. Uh, we had it originally planned uh, in the spring, but had to postpone because of COVID. Um, we're glad we could make that happen. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great night.